Hey, good morning. I'm here with Saul Kaplan, who is the founder and chief catalyst of the Business Innovation Factory in Providence, Rhode Island. And I've known Saul and his team since 2008, and, and i got to tell you something. Um, what I know about Saul and his team is that they have a passion for innovation and for transformation. Um, their business model is all about experimenting in the real world with a network of collabor collaborators who, in, in Saul's words, are audacious enough to change everything. Now, I know that I can learn a lot from a guy like that and a team like that. So, Saul, thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure, Dirk. It's always good to, to be with you. How are you this morning? I'm doing dynamite. Thank right. you. I'm really looking forward to this. And just right off the bat, to let everybody know they can learn more about the Business Innovation Factory at www.businessinnovationfactory.com. But, Saul, if you don't mind, let's just jump right into it, okay? Let's do it. Yeah, so I know your entire business model is built around innovation. Yeah. Yeah. So just to begin with, would you mind defining in, in, in your words, your teams, are, what is innovation from your perspective? Sure. The, well, first of all, I mean, innovation, uh, it's a great day to be an innovator. I mean, th these are, this is our day. The, if you think about it, during difficult economic times, which we're surely in, people pay attention to innovators. They want new ideas. You know, they want new solutions. They're looking for new sources of, of, of revenue. So this is really the innovator's day. That's the good news. The bad news is that we've turned the word into a buzzword. Right, that everything is an innovation and everybody's an innovator. And of course, if that's true, nothing is and no one is. I offer a very simple you know, definition. You know, Dirk. To me, innovation is a better way to deliver value. Innovation is a better way to deliver value. It's really that simple. I know people uh, have complicated uh, definitions, but to me, it's not an innovation until it actually delivers, until it solves a problem. We tend to confuse innovation and invention. You know, we tend to conflate those two, two words. I mean, invention what, is the, what is the difference, Saul, between innovation and uh yeah, well, it, to me, I mean, innovation is when you actually solve the problem. It's yeah. when you deliver value. You, you may not need to invent anything new, but we live in a culture today. Our society is very innovation crazy. Invention crazy, I mean. You know, like it's all about building the new gizmo, building the new widget. We have more invention. We have more technology than we know how to use. It's not technology that's getting in the way of fixing the really big problems we face. Right. It's us humans. I mean, we're stubbornly resistant to change. We don't change. So to me, innovation is really just finding a better way and solving the problem. And when you actually solve it, when you can actually demonstrate it in the real world, that's an innovation. Love it. Love it. So am I, am I hearing you say that, that we're, we're kind, we've, we've kind of missed, uh, we're off track a little bit in that we're focused on invention rather than innovation, which as you say, actually drives value? We need a better balance between the two. I mean, I love invention. I'm glad, you know, in this country and around the world, we're focused on creating new technologies and creating new inventions. But our, the balance is out of whack. We're too focused on invention and not focused enough on solving the problems. How do we use technology that we've already created to actually solve the problem? I mean, just look at the, the things we talk about all the time, you know, yeah. little things like education, you know, and healthcare and energy. I mean, with all this great technology, you think we'd be much further ahead. It's because we're too focused on the inputs, right? The inventions, and we're not focused on the outputs or the real value delivered or solving the problem. We need a better balance and more focus on the outputs so that we can harness technology to solve a lot of these problems. Yeah, love it. Now, I understand that uh, within your business model, you actually use what I think you term experience labs, yep. to get out there and, and, and um, innovate and experiment in the real world, in yep. healthcare, in education, with entrepreneurship and, and with energy. So would it yep. be fair to ask, can, can, can you give us an example sure. of, of you know, input versus output in one of those 
areas? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I use a, a highly technical you know, term. We need to try more stuff. We're too <laughs> afraid to try. We're too afraid to experiment. People don't like to fail, and we've created organizations you know, that don't like to fail. And we need to fail a lot more. We just need to fail more intentionally. We need to fail faster by trying more stuff. You can take any one of the big social challenges we have. Let's take education you know, for an example. I mean, you want to cry when you look at our education system. And it's not for lack of new technology that could help us. It's because we're stuck in our current business models, right? We're stuck in the way we delivered value yesterday, and we don't know how to experiment and change. Why aren't we taking technology and instead of throwing it at the the existing system, which isn't working, yeah. why aren't we carving out the conditions in the real world to try new approaches to education that are more student-driven and more student-centered, that use technology in a more disruptive way than in the sustaining way that we're using them today? And why don't we experiment? And Why don't we try a lot more things? We tend to build up antigens. We're allergic to the experiments, to the new things. Just look at charter schools. Yeah. I mean, around the country, we put up uh, amazing charter schools, many of which that have, have created much better outcomes for our urban youth. But what do we do, right? We turn them into pariahs. We make them outcasts. We don't learn from what they're doing. We don't try to apply what they're doing in improving you know, the current system because we're resistant to change and we don't want to change the, the current system. So my belief is that we should be experimenting more. And I often talk about something called the connected adjacency, a sandbox that we build next to the current model or next to the current system. So unlike with the charter school movement, where we've created hundreds and hundreds of charter schools that are very, very successful, but they're not connected in any meaningful way, why aren't we experimenting from within the system, building sandboxes where we can experiment constrained by the existing rules that might allow us to do a better job of serving the needs of students. And God forbid, why don't we actually ask students and put them at the center of this redesign process? So what we're doing at BIF, the Business Innovation Factory, is we're creating real-world laboratories with partners that want to go up this transformation curve, that want to reimagine and reinvent the way these business models and systems work in areas like education and healthcare and energy. But it applies to every organization and every leader. Today, we need to learn how to reinvent ourselves. Without question, Saul. That's great, great insight. Thank you. Now, just based on what you've said that, you know, that we don't experiment enough, that we, we look to sustain rather than disrupt, um, looking, you know, based on what you said, that we're resistant to change. Um, my interpretation is that we as humans, we as individuals, we as professionals, we, we have a long way to go um, to, to become um, truly that I- innovative catalyst uh, mm-hmm. within our organizations, within our society, within our yep. community. And, and, and I know that you've talked about at least four, I don't know if it's the right words, but four criteria of, uh, of individuals that, that you have found are the innovative okay. ones. And, and can we talk about those four sure, criteria? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things I've heard you say is that innovators, first and foremost, have a very strong point of view. Now, I know a lot of people yep. with a strong point of view, and I don't know if they're innovating, innovating so yep. Can, can you just tell me what you mean by that? They have a strong yeah, point of view? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes about uh, innovators is uh, uh, from my friend Roger Martin. He's the dean of the Rotman School up in Toronto. Yeah, one of the, the uh, really clear uh, expertise in the area of design and business and how they fit together. Anyway, but, uh, what, uh, what Roger says is that uh, innovators have a really strong point of view, but they know they're missing something. So let me take each part of that. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really important quote. They have a strong point of view, but they know they're missing something. So all innovators, people that you know, are not afraid at sharing their ideas. They're not uh, afraid at expressing their point of view and what they think the answer is. They have a lot of confidence uh, in, in their ideas, and they're not afraid to put them forward. 
And I think that's true of all innovators. But the piece that, that is really important that I think defines an innovator is the second part. They know they're missing something. They are vulnerable enough to put their ideas out there and they want to get better. They want to get the pushback. They want the naysayers to push back on their ideas. They want people to point them in new directions. They're vulnerable in that way. They don't think they always have the right answer. They might have a point of view, but they're willing to put the point of view out in traffic and connect it with what I call unusual suspects, other people who can react to those ideas and help to make them better. Innovators are always trying to get better. They always believe there's a better way, whether it's a small little thing or a great big thing like a social system that they're trying to transform. And they know that the only way that they can do it is if they put themselves out there in traffic and make themselves vulnerable to the inevitable pushback that you're going to get when you put your ideas out there. Boy, great insight. And, you know, the word that, that keeps resonating with me, Saul, in, in that definition is use vulnerability a number of times in that. Yeah. And, and, and I, I just sense, you know, hell, looking in the mirror. You know, I just sense, you know, that, that's very, very hard for individuals and organizations to do. Yep. And if you watch, if you, if, if you track innovators uh, and hang out with them like I always try to do, you know, it's amazing to me how vulnerable they really are. You know, you wouldn't think so, but they are really vulnerable. They really care about what people think. They care about what people say about their ideas, and yet they keep putting themselves out in traffic, you know, so that their ideas and their solutions can get better. I love it. Love it. Thank you. So, all right. So we, we, we have to have that strong point of view, but we've got to be willing to put ourselves out there and know that we don't have all the answers. And, That's right. and I really, you've got us thinking in terms of being vulnerable. So I appreciate that. Um, a, a second thing I think that you say is that innovators um, require uh, perseverance. Yeah, yeah, they sure do. You, you, you never get it right on the first time. It goes back to this trying more stuff and experimenting. I mean, innovators are constantly trying new stuff, constantly changing their ideas, and they're looking for what works in the real world. And the only way to figure that out is by being more experimental and sticking with it. I mean, if you drop the idea, you know, the first time it doesn't work. I mean, you would never be successful. I mean, this is true of all entrepreneurs. They never get their business model right on the first try, ever, 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 right? So, so when we are brought up in large corporations where we don't like to fail, where you, know, you have to get it right or it'll be a career-limiting move, it goes completely against what entrepreneurs and innovators do, which is they take the best solution they've got, you know, they put it out in the market and they try it and they see what works and they try to scale it from there. And if it doesn't work, they change it and they just keep going. They're like ever-ready buddies and they never give up. Yeah, I love it. You know, one of the uh, great images I have in my mind, Saul, was from – when I attended your Biff Seven last year, yeah, yeah. And, and I think it was Graham Milner from WD40. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, well, yeah. It wasn't Graham great. It was just phenomenal, and it, it just every time I look at that WD40 can now and understand its meaning, that yeah. it was yeah. the 40th uh, Isn't that great? iteration of, of of the substance of the chemical. Um, it just reminds me that you know what we need to fail. We need to keep trying. We need to keep going after uh, that vision, but it's going to fail. At first. What a great story, isn't it? Uh, Graham Milner at uh, last year's Fifth Summit. Yeah, as you say, he held up the can of WD-40, and, and none of us in the room, me included, none, yeah. ha had a clue how WD-40, we all know what it is, we all use it, right. but we had no idea what its origin was, and to learn that it was water displacement formula number 40, you know, you know it took 40 tries to get the thing right. You know, until it actually stuck. So you're right. It's a great reminder. I mean, you know, sometimes it takes 40 tries, you know, to do it, and you have to be uh, perseverant in order to to make it happen. Absolutely. Well done. Thank you.